Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for Data Opportunities in Asset Management. I shall now hand you over to Dominic Hobson and the panel. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance and welcome to our webinar on the Data Opportunity in Asset Management. Data is one of the most exciting themes we follow at Future of Finance and we're eager to understand how the digitization of increasing quantities of information is affecting the different parts of the financial services industry. Now, asset managers, of course, have always relied on price and economic data to make their portfolio investment decisions. Now, under pressure from cost transparency, the shift to passive investing and rising levels of regulatory interest in what they do, they are looking at data to improve efficiency at every level, from portfolio management and execution in the front office, to risk management and financing in the middle office, to settlement and custody in the back office. That means an awful lot is being asked of data. It's expected to cut costs, raise productivity, design better investment products, distribute those products more successfully. In short, data is seen as a way to make more money. But data is also expected to make compliance easier, and not just in terms of the KYC, AML, CFT and sanction screening obligations, which are such a burden in the industry today, not even the obligation to treat customers fairly and not missell them products but actually to comply meaningfully with environmental, social and governance mandates, ESG as well. So the expectations of better data management on the buy side are running extremely high. The promise of data is equally rich, but getting from where we are now to where we'd like to be in the future means an awful lot of things need to be fixed. And to help us work out what the asset management industry and just as importantly, its service providers in the shape of custodian banks and transfer agents and others data providers, data vendors, what they need to do and how they're going about it. We're joined by four experts in the field. Greg Glass is Executive Director at Alpha Data Solutions, a cloud-based service of management consultants, Alpha FMC, that helps asset managers capture, manage, and deliver customer revenues, stocks, and flows to create a customer book of record, a CBOR. Ian Hunt is a computer scientist and consultant to the asset management industry, who's now involved in two blockchain ventures and an investment book of record, or IBOR, project. John Plansky is a former partner at Booz & Company and its parent, PwC, who joined State Street four years ago to lead the development of Alpha, the data-driven platform for global asset managers. Jonathan Hammond is also a computer scientist and now a partner at consultant Psionic, where he specializes in asset management. Now, in addition to our panelists, we do also have you, our audience, and all five of us encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments throughout this webinar by using the functionality at the bottom of your screens. We will not save them up to the end, but we will answer them uh, as we go along. And with that, I now turn to our panelists to get the conversation going. Now, uh, 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 Greg, perhaps I could start with you. I, I made a great many assumptions in my opening remarks there about why asset managers are embarking on this data management quest. Uh, a, my question is, how fair is my assessment of the factors that are driving asset managers to look at uh, data management solutions? But B, and perhaps more importantly, what is it they're actually seeking to do? What's the end state they're driving towards? What would they like to have? Gosh, great question, Dominic. Um, Two questions, I'm afraid, Greg, sorry. Let's start with the first one and just keep it very sort of high level. So three three sort of drivers, if you like. Um, the first is uh, cost reduction. There's a, there's a massive cost associated with handling uh, data uh, across across the firm. Um, at Alpha, we sort of refer to it as a as a, a messy data problem, which in just in a dozen or so domains cost the, the top 400 ma managers in excess of a, a, a billion dollars a year and an avoidable cost. <clears throat> so there's that cost saving bucket there. Uh, and, and the background to that is the rising volumes of data and, and the nature of that data being sort of, you know, changeable, not all of it conforms to a standard, uh, very diverse. There's a lot of work that has to happen to standardize it. Uh, the second is ever present regulation. So there's a, there's a, in increasing pressure on, on asset managers uh, from regulators and data is required to report with in increased accuracy, frequency, and sort of detail. And, and just a really interesting point about as you move into a increased scrutiny from, from regulators, 
uh, as you, if you have to report with more granularity and more frequency, the reconciliation liability about being consistent over a point in time increases as well. So the, the engineering that has to go on in terms of managing data becomes a more significant uh, challenge, sort of increases geometrically. Uh, and then the third bucket obviously is, is around value, business value and, and competitive differentiation. That's what people like to, to think about, about the data transformation that, that's um, you know, in front of the asset management industry. And that's sales enablement. So um, being able to prioritize scarce and expensive sales resources uh, against the, you know, the best, best clients at, at the most opportune moment and to, to customize that, that dialogue with customers. Everything particularly relevant with, with COVID uh, is just this increase, you know, 2030 has come forward to 2021 and, and digital, that digital experience has generated a lot of extra data, which is a different in nature, sort of big, big data structures and managers are wrestling with that and how to integrate that against client master economic data to understand who's engaging with them across digitally and then how they should respond and tailor that, cost, that, that client experience as well. Um, so those three buckets um, are pretty obvious that sales enablement, business value, di differentiation, um, the cost drivers, and then regulation. Thanks, Greg. Now, now John, John Plansky, uh, you know, I've talked about an asset management firm as if it's a single entity, but of course it isn't. It's got lots of different constituents inside it. It's got portfolio managers, it's got sales and marketing, compliance, finance, fund accounting, it's got operations. Now, they all have different needs. So what, if you were to, to try and summarize, looking at a, a major global asset management house, what are they actually seeking out of a comprehensive data management solution? How do you cater for all those different constituencies? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would say that, you know, I joined State Street as, you know, Don, you said in early 2017 as a senior partner at Booz. And I actually joined State Street and took over what was a small business looking at trying to provide data services. And I would say it was very oriented, as you can imagine, to operations people and those folks, those types of personas at clients. And if the decision we made was if we're going to serve the asset managers with a true data-driven platform is that we had to be relevant um, in the front office, the portfolio managers, chief investment officers, traders, risk managers making decisions. Um, that's why we bought Charles River. You know, it was a huge bet to buy Charles River at State Street, but fundamentally it was because from our point of view, it, it kind of starts with those executives in their teams as asset managers are trying to create alpha, differentiate themselves, compete in the market. It's those set of professionals that are accountable for that. And then the operations folks and the finance folks and everybody else has to support them in a way that makes it successful. And so when we think about now with Charles River, after two years of acquiring them and launching our data platform as part of Alpha, you know, I would say we, we begin with those professionals because if we're not making a difference for them, uh, chances are the asset manager isn't gonna realize his strategy. But when you do that, you pick up the other folks as well. So if we have data that's been harmonized, that's been um, pulled together in a way that it's common data sets for securities and positions, accounts, et cetera, um, it creates a much, as Greg said, a much different operating environment as well. Um, so I would say it starts with the folks that are driving the strategy and are accountable for the results of the firm at the top line. And then if because of it's an enterprise approach, we actually get the benefit of serving as well. The people have to deliver the infrastructure for those executives to be successful. Thanks, John. Ian, you've heard John describe how at State Street, the Alpha platform was building a complete front middle back office service and it's driven very much out of the, out of the front office. A, do you agree with that? And B, what do you think all these different constituencies within the average asset management, or well not average, within the global asset management houses are actually seeking? What do they want? Oh, I think it's all got too, you know, too difficult for asset managers, the complexity of infrastructures and managing um, what we've inherited from an era when everyone was into best of breed and every department had its own platform with its own local data store. 
um, and we have multiple replications of, of position data, transaction data, client data around the organization. Um, and culturally, it was seen as desirable to allow the individual uh, functional leads to pick their own and pick their own solutions and then string them together in some or other way through integration. And that process has ended up in an absolute you know, mess of complexity and cost and restriction. And uh, in the average asset manager, you know, until the trend to um, drop a mega application like um, Aladdin or Simcorp or whatever onto those businesses to, to get rid of some of the um, uh, business area specific platforms, then you know, there was a huge amount of asym um, asynchronous messaging, huge amount of reconciliation and blizzards of reconciliations between both between internal systems, internal platforms, and with external service providers. So that management of, of a hugely complex integration environment uh, slows everything down because every time you want to do a project, you're changing something that has implications with 10 other platforms. And I think that became an unmanageable situation when we had things like um, market EDM, KDIS as special purpose tools, which came in to try and help us to manage that level of complexity. Um, but that's really, you know, that's the wrong kind of, that's the wrong approach. We need to be looking at simplification where we actively avoid having replicating, uh, replicated uh, data, uh, data stores we now have some mechanisms for dealing with that. So we have the ability of um, distributed ledger technology to uh, share data across different platforms, across different users in an identical form without asynchronous messaging and without, and without reconciliations. So we need to be exploring that kind of um, pathway uh, because it hits, you know, hits right at the, uh, the the root of a of a serious problem for asset managers. So I think the result is, you know, is cost and is inflexibility, and asset managers want to get rid of both of those. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, Jonathan, uh, we talked about this. I was going to add to, actually, sorry, Dominic, I was going to add to what um, to Ian said, and actually I agree with uh, both uh, Ian and John, actually. Uh, but I think we need to recognise the... Um, the sophistication or the growing sophistication of stakeholders in data um, and the, the conflict in terms of the uh, delivery that people require. So, I mean, you know, stakeholders are getting more sophisticated. Clients need more data. They need it in, in raw data form so they can report to their own clients and the regulators. You know, portfolio management are looking for, you know, data flexibility in the way that they consume and shape data. You know, and accuracy and timeliness are constant trade-offs from, from their perspective. You know, the sales and distribution teams are looking for quality again but they're also looking for consistency in the fewest possible errors i mean everybody's looking for that but i mean you know data should tie up from one report and presentation to the next and certainly within you know report and presentation um and operations you know i mean they're looking for certainty you know confirmation that the data they're responsible for is accurate so you know people are looking for different things but also the sophistication of users and you know portfolio the portfolio management the line between you know, IT and portfolio managers is, 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 be, is blurring as, as people, you know, would like to use data themselves uh, and develop applications. Now, that's usually seen as a something that's not desirable in asset manager. You know, IT should control the way that uh, data is used, but um, you, we're, create, we're, we're creating a divide by doing that between the portfolio managers who'd like flexibility to do something with data um, and, the, and the restrictions that, you know, we, we, we desire to put on them by, uh, by controlling them in the first place. So I interrupted you then. Well, I was, I was going to ask you, in fact, uh, and I'd like Greg to chip in on this as well. Uh, we, we, uh, until you started talking, we had talked about it entirely from the point of view of the asset management firm rather than the clients. And asset managers do obviously have clients, and the clients, as you pointed out, uh, need data for their own reporting purposes. Are we clear what, what those clients want to see, or is there a huge variegation in what clients want to see as well? Um, well, from my perspective, I think there's, there's variation. I mean, it, and it depends who you're talking to. I mean, certainly most clients of a particular type have, have specific regulatory reports that they need to uh, to satisfy. And most of them are looking to their asset managers to help provide some of that data. Um, but they are obviously making demands on the asset managers as well in terms of the depth of data that they were able to provide and actually having greater transparency through to the asset managers' own operations and the, and the, uh, and the metrics that they're 
using to select and uh, manage the portfolios on the client's behalf. Um, naturally, if clients have multiple portfolios across the managers, they're looking to consolidate that information and provide that in a single way. So, you know, really, there's, there's a huge variety. And it's about customization and tailoring for a client's perspective so that those clients um, are getting the, getting the data that they, that they <coughs> need. But please, you know, Greg, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I, I guess I think there's a dirty secret in the industry that if you if you ask asset managers privately, you know, how good is your data for, for talking to clients, they'll, they'll go candidly. Actually, you know, we know that, that it's it's broadly accurate, but it's not pinpoint uh, accuracy. Um, and I think we've all talked to heads of sales who've come back from talking to an important client and go opening conversation and talk about the, the you know, Thank you very much for, for you know the, the money that we're running for you and the, and the client and the salesperson disagree about or, or don't have the same number written down on either side of the table about how much running now that that's quite a fundamental sort of level of sort of accuracy it doesn't happen everywhere but it, but it, it's more common than people would would realize um, if you think about uh, we, we talk a, a little bit alpha data data solutions about the client book of record um, definition being so the economic data, so flows, holdings, revenue, match a very sort of granular view of clients. So I guess the sales view of client, not just the contracted business, but also the uncontracted business, not just the omnibus account or the TA account, but with platform data laid over the top of it to look through to the sub register. And I think um, you know that that becomes the foundation for the con the the external conversation. To your point, Dominic, about what, what managers, rather than looking in and, and looking at MI and analyzing you know, the, the, the investment, but looking at it from a client-centric point of view and organizing data around the, 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 the client master, the client record, and then using that to sort of tailor the conversations with clients. And one of the big conversations at the moment that, that clients are asking managers is what's my impact? Right, so we've had a new data set merge really, you know, it's been around since the 70s, but it's really picked up steam in the last five years in terms of ESG data. If you think of the, the complexity for managers, uh, a, a, many are just wrestling with that in the, in the, in the front office to understand uh, how that ESG data overlays, you know, across, across their investment decisions. But to then to acute, uh, communicate to a client who wants to know across all the money you're running for me, what's my total impact? That's a really hard question for managers to answer right now. And a lot of managers are spending a lot of time and midnight oil to try and get to that answer. But <laughs> if, um, if the other panelists either agree with that point of view. And say, yeah, a, lot, a lot of managers uh, find it very difficult even to work out what their own assets under management are. So, you know, giving, giving clients accurate data is a, is, a, is a major challenge. And it's always the case when you're looking at... Um, Universal book of record, investment book of record across the across the business. It's a major issue that the people at the front end are looking at different data and different versions of data from the people uh, talking to the clients, and you know that has uh, image and confidence um, consequences and potentially regulatory consequences. Yeah, I think I'd add is just I think one of the things we've learned again by acquiring Charles River is we now can see all those books are records and own the source code for all of them, at least in some sub, some subset of our clients. We also, you know, because we understand all that are working with third parties as well, whether it's risk firms like MSCI or others to align against some kind of data model, um, a more common way to interpret, understand. And I think there's two parts. Some other point I want to make is I think there's two parts of this challenge in data. One is, you know, as we said, within the asset manager, how do we make that experience better? The other, and this is where kind of, if you want to look to the future and how we think about the data platform in the future is, you know, we actually provide that platform to asset owners and wealth managers and alternatives firms and others as well that are in this ecosystem. And so if our data model, um, if we're open to aligning our data model in an open way, to third parties and those clients that are our clients, we think there's an opportunity to help our asset managers work with asset owners and their clients, for example, because we're actually there already with the same idea of a platform. They consume data off this platform already. 
And so that's where Snowflake shows up in combination with the data model. So there's a lot of, I think, it's not, today's about solving the asset manager problems kind of in the asset manager. I think that's the most important thing we're doing. But we start thinking about beyond the asset manager, them dealing with external parties, the real power of a platform is, is positioning that platform in a way where the ecosystem can benefit. Um, and that's the big idea we have you know, with this alpha data platform. We're going to come back to that um, a, a yeah. bit later, a bit later, John. But could I ask you about, about we've had the questions are starting to come in now. We've had had one on LEIs, which I'll come to in a minute. It's, it's quite an interesting angle to it. But could I ask this very interesting question from uh, Christian uh, Schofer here, who writes, in the end game, what will remain to be the two key differentiators of asset managers uh, from your perspective? Now, John, if you're... Okay. Um, effectively running the data flows for, for an asset manager. What, the classic argument is that that means the asset manager can focus on what they're really, really good at. And what do you think the asset manager of the future is going to be really, really good at? What's going to be their differentiating factor? You're not allowed to say alpha. Yeah, no, 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 I got it. And so they tell us this, because what happens is with this proposal, you know, we've got about a dozen or so clients now gone with us um, the last you know, 18 months. What they tell us is what they want to focus on is how they differentiate with call it distribution. Like how can they deepen relationships and in a, in a, more significant relationships with their clients? And secondly, how can they expand and differentiate their product sets you know, in a very nuanced way, right? Some firms, you know, there's asset managers come in all different flavors, uh, but they want to empower their teams to truly compete in that area, while we are providing, call it the infrastructure. Now, as you said, Dominic, they all these clients are retaining then the data strategy, the full data strategy, our clients are retaining that, right? They're the ones deciding at the end point, what is it that's differentiating them in those places? What they wanna do is align that with our strategy so that it's, a, it's one continuum, right? So we're playing a key role but ultimately the client in that differentiation of distribution, clients, product strategies, expansion, you know, that's what they see as their differentiator from the ones, the clients we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. The most fundamental differentiation with uh, an asset manager, if you boil it down to what they're doing, it's the quality of their intellectual property. It's the quality of their views of market. It's their quality of, of sentiment. And even the, even the process of portfolio construction out of that is um, you know, to a large extent could be a, a separable business. Mm -hmm. I think you know, the, the, the differentiation for an asset management, an asset manager is in how good their intellectual property is. And then they have downstream processes from that which apply that intellectual property to portfolios. And increasingly that is a, a, an automatable process given the technology available to us. So mass customization is becoming a feasible achieve a feasible objective, and there are managers, significant managers now that are running, you know, maybe a thousand portfolios from one investment process, and the rollout is is based on on automation. So the data in that has to be right. The, the the mandate data, the investment objectives, the risk appetite data has to be. Uh, pretty slick in order for us to be able to run that mass customization process. And that will allow us to bring the level of service that uh, is delivered to in institutional clients down into the lower lower, you know, lower levels of, um, of asset management client. Now, I'd like to, to turn in a minute to uh, actually how you go about um, starting to build these uh, data management platforms for asset management. Before we do, uh, I'd like to address this question from Gerard Hartsink, who is involved with the, uh, the Global Legal Entity Foundation. Now, it might seem a bit off topic, but uh, probably not if you if you stop to think about it. A, how important is it for asset managers to understand who their, their counterparts are? I'd have thought very important, particularly in the cases like, like prime brokerage or, or even custody, despite the fact it's off the balance sheet. But he also asks here, you know, how they're doing this mapping program, uh, the, the LEI, um, he wants to know how, how this could be better explained to asset managers. You know, how, can, how, can, how can asset managers be brought on board with the, with the LEI program? But one thought I have about this is that this is where digital identity comes in and 
uh, what part does LEI play in that? Because there are asset managers, well, a couple of you already mentioned this, uh, spending a lot of money uh, onboarding clients and re-onboarding clients every one to three years. So LEIs might be able to help there as well if they are uh, spread more generally around. Does anyone have a, a, a comment on that? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I can speak momentarily to that. I mean, but I'm not sure I can take, take, um, tell Jared any more than he does. He already knows. But I mean, the uh, um, I mean, it's it's not just the LEI itself, uh, the identity of the um, of the um, of the counterparty. But um, and, and you know, from most asset managers' perspective, this is is, is essential for their, again for their regulatory reporting um, and risk assessment. But it's also the um, uh, the ownership structures um, of those of those LEIs across multiple parties. So that's what most of them are, um, are, are trying to seek to understand is you know who owns who owns that corporate entity that I'm that I'm either dealing with or I'm buying into or. Uh, uh, or I'm, 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 I'm dealing with, you know, how far does it go up the tree, and um, you know, where where do the um, where do the ultimate parents lie in terms of geographic reach, ge um, um, uh, corporate ownership? So um, I'm sure that Jared knows all this, but it's uh, it's, it's essential. I, I'd have thought that asset managers would be biting his arm off to try and uh, uh, to understand this if, if he's got a, a solution that um, uh, that caters for it. And Dominic, just to add to what Jonathan said there, we we see uh, obviously all of that importance around understanding who your clients are. We just see, a, um, and, it, and it picks up a little bit on what John mentioned about data model of, uh, you know, and the importance of a data model and understanding an ecosystem is, is for managers to understand the role on agreement or role on account of a legal entity. And, and what we see sometimes is that uh, managers um, don't necessarily have a data model that's rich enough to be able to be able to look at an agreement, look at an account, and look at all the roles that various legal entities are playing. And that's really essential if you're trying to look at, uh, you know, uh, influence on pools of assets, either via custodians or, or consultants, etc. But also, you know, more sort of regulatory uh, matters around making sure that you, in your systems of record, you're reporting accurately on who the beneficial owner is versus the the contracting, you know, the party that you're actually contracting with. And LEIs are absolutely fundamental to the digital identity construct. And uh, at the moment, in, in the past, let's say, and up to now, you know, we've run, in, in a typical asset manager, there would be multiple places where client data is is held, clearly getting getting to the point where we have within the, within the organisation um, a single def definitive source of client data, and that's tied to LEA, LEIs so that we know exactly who we're talking about. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't make any sense for every asset manager to be running a separate um, view of entities and uh, any, any more than it makes sense for asset managers individually to be sourcing their own prices um, or sourcing their own market data or their own calendar data or whatever. So I think we need to get to the point where we have credible digital identity service available, just like we want to have you know, a, a credible standard market data service available and an uh, analytic and pricing data service so that we can start to build more flexibly on top of this. And uh, you know, the, an absolutely key part of that is, is um, common entity data, and that is supported by LERs. So, Ian, do do asset managers you talk to have a thing called an entity entity master? No, they don't. But it's kind of crawling towards it, and I think the basically, if we're going to get away from having being controlled by mega applications of a kind of Aladdin and SimCorp and um, Bloomberg Aim variety, then we have to we we have to have some common data services that will enable us quickly and without replicating data um, stores quickly to develop applets, quickly to develop um, uh, functionality which supports the business in a, in a more bespoke way. I mean, we've swung from, from best of breed where everyone had uh, their own platform into this kind of culture of everyone herds towards um, Aladdin or whatever. Um, you know, we have to move away. We have to get to the point where we can have more flexibility, more dexterity, um, and we can respond much more quickly to change, mm -hmm. reduce our dependence on these kind of behemoth platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is having a credible um, 
book of record service, a credible transaction master, supporting position extraction. Part of that is having a credible entity master. And those don't have to be internal. I, I bet John Plansky is itching to, I noticed that the State Street Alpha platform wasn't on your list of, of people who are creating silos in the industry. Um, Alpha is famously a, an open platform. Um, did you leave it off your list deliberately, Ian? No, no, maybe because it hasn't got there yet. I mean, it hasn't become sufficiently dominant. I mean, Charles River has has obviously been very successful um, in the front, in the it, as a portfolio master, as compliance master, mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately into the trading space. But you know, it wasn't a everything in one place. And by the way, we take over your operation for you as well. Okay, John, well, I, I'd like you to, to address that, but I'd like you to address the issue more, more generally as well, because I'd like to get into now just how difficult it is to do this. One of you used the phrase uh, domains, uh, and global asset managers obviously have lots of domains, uh, by which we mean databases, among other things. They've got to be made consistent within some sort of achievable tolerance. They're presumably stuck on spreadsheets and CRM systems and vendor applications and data services you buy from other vendors. So we, you know, already in this discussion, we've used the term entity master. I think we've used IBOR, investment book of record. We used, I don't think we've used ABOR yet, but I, I've seen uh, ABOR, IBOR, CBOR, TBOR, PBOR, and even UBOR. So there are lots of the product master, security master, entity master, risk master. There are lots of different bits of jargon around there. So John, just give us an idea. You go into a big global asset management house. How big a mess, and this is Greg's term, how big a mess confronts you? Really big mess. You know, so the bigger, the messier. Um, so I would say we start off when we engage with our clients exactly in this challenge. Like we have a chart that we use. You know, we we have a very a large, you know, multi-trillion asset manager that's part of State Street. And of course, we've got the benefit of working with them early on some of these ideas, as well as all the other you know, there's a bunch of Charles River clients that are going with us on this idea of a platform end to end and, and have seen and worked with us on the alpha data platform. So it's extremely messy. Um, I think you said it well already and the team's talked about it very well, breaking this down to into domains that go all the way from, you know, security oriented domains, benchmark oriented through IBOR to ABOR and really doing that in an intelligent way. You know, one thing I talk to folks about is when you talk about architecture, um, you can always tell a real architect that's a data architect or because they all look like uh, me in terms of my age and <laughs> they've done it about four or five times to keep iterating and iterating and iterating versus a programmer that might be look a lot different than me who's a lights out you know, programmer in Python. I think you have to have gone through it a lot and seen these workflows and understand them and understand what the current providers, how it works from a Bloomberg or IHS market, understand what an IBOR is and isn't, understand ABOR to really architect a data model and an approach that's going to be today, make a big difference, but more importantly, position for tomorrow. And so I think, and your point about the services approach. So uh, when we think about the platform, as I said, step one is, configure for the client something that gives them a benefit for sure in the next, you know, call it five years. Um, and that's bringing these domains together, figuring out the way they do ABOR and IBOR on it manufactured data. In our case, if it's our technology at State Street from CRD on back, we obviously are in control of that, but we also work with everybody to try to harmonize it. I think at the industry level, then there's opportunities to if we do it right, to bring that data model more broadly and start picking off services that everybody would agree. You know, they're not, differenti they're not differentiating the value of an asset manager. They're just services that make it way easier to do business with other firms and get things you know, done. So whether, you know, LEI, I was there in the early last five years ago, people launched the LEI, the LEI services for AML. You know, those things got gobbled up by the data providers. You know, that's a good one you know, to extend someday we can provide that type of service. But in the meantime, it's kind of, it's one of those domains. And on the masters, I think, Dominic, the way we implement it in the shorter term is our platform has to have this mastering capability. So in these domain groupings, if it's a security or entity, 
uh, benchmarked, et cetera, we have to be able to master, and by master we mean, how do we make it relevant across these workflows that our clients have? Um, as it turns out, what we've seen, given if you have that experience and you've got people on your team that have been through this a lot, that and have this vision of more of a common platform versus another monolith, uh, then the technology of today makes it easier, like much easier. Like we've adopted cloud, tools like Snowflake, uh, digital ledger technology in certain areas is making a difference. I think the technology is gonna make this much more likely to pull off than we have in the past, but it takes all of those things together. The experience, the data model, the ambition not to own everything and be a monolith and the ability to leverage new tech, I think to make a difference in the industry. Now, um, you've heard, um, uh, Greg, maybe some of you comment on it. You, you've heard, Greg, this is actually a very complicated exercise. It's an evolving one. Uh, you don't get there in, in one go. The technology has improved. You know, the native cloud makes it a bit easier to do this than, it, than, than it would, we would have found it 20 years ago. But should, we, should I be disappointed here that, that, that we're actually just still stuck with a, with a data warehouse, which is the way we thought about this problem 20, 20 years ago? Are there no shortcuts here? Is there nothing that, that a blockchain or an AI or something can do? Is there, is there some way of fast forwarding to the future? Greg. I think, thanks, Dominic. I think um, that with data and, and particularly the kind of data that's really dominant in asset management, which is numbers, you know, you've got numbers and words, right? And they both have different characteristics, but essentially it's a numbers business. And, I, and I, at some point, I'd like to come back to this point around the amount of reconciliation that goes on within the within the firm and, um, you know, which has kind of become normative and that people have just got used to the amount of reconciliation between, between numbers. What I'd say is when you're engineering numbers, we really don't think there's a magic bullet. It's perspiration. You just have to work really, really hard. And, and a couple of reasons for that. Yeah. One is that we are where we are and you can look at the cultural reasons and just the history of asset management from, you know, Fleming days, you know, in those early days and, and how the business has grown up. It, the, the data sort of ran away from the, from the firms because the main focus of the business was around the investment idea. And, and I think managing data was, was ancillary and there were always enough margin to sort of throw money at, at, at data problems. And what's happened is the beast has got really, really large now. And so we're not starting from a clean sheet of paper, which is let's standardize all the data, let's propose industry standards, let's put in fresh, clean technology. And the kind of, you know, the work that John has to do, uh, you know, with his platform and, and State Street is you've, you've got to work with a lot of legacy uh, problems. And I, and I, I just think um, the, the only option is a new entrant coming in. And you're starting to see that with the fintechs and, and managers starting to, you know, partner up with, you know, Ant, if you like, although that's that's obviously hit the scuppers just, just recently, that... Though the new entrants that really can start with a clean sheet and don't have to deal with the legacy are probably best placed to sort of come in with, with advanced technology uh, and, and, and really lower their cost of, of, of um, management and managing data. But I think the thing that we haven't talked about is culture and data structures are power structures. And all the various players in the, in the industry and in the ecosystem are hanging on to their data and, and, and that's a, you know, a particularly rational thing to do. And if you just go back to the, the point where the, the question earlier around the two key differentiators for asset management, which I agree with John and Ian and their answers, maybe different words for the same thing, but it's the investment idea and understanding client needs and how you relate those two things. I guess the question is, if that's ultimately the, the, the unique proposition of an asset manager, does that mean that everything else could go and everything else could be outsourced and if that's the case, what's in the way? Why hasn't that happened already? Because I think there are just cultural sort of blocks at the moment for managers reinventing themselves or a bit of creative destruction. Uh, and, and, and I think to your, to your question about, is there a magic technical solution? There's, there's, there always is, but you know, businesses are very complicated and you need to consider cultural factors as well. 
Yeah. Outsourcers are stuck in, uh, in, a, in a lot of cases in a daily cycle with an assumption of an accounting centric you know, view of data management where you flush and refresh on a daily basis and they provide a single snapshot for you know, all purposes of position data on a, you know, on a, on a, on a daily cycle. And uh, you know, if, you, if your whole architecture and your whole mindset is stuck in that way, then it's very, very difficult to extend services meaningfully into the front office, meaningfully into multiple internal asset management uh, functions. And I think we are seeing some fintechs, um, people like Finborn, Aprexo, some stuff we've been doing with uh, Risk First within Moody's, where what we're doing is, is changing very much from the uh, data warehouse approach where you accept the fact that you've got multiple platforms containing multiple uh, data stores that overlap and are inconsistent. You lump them all into a data warehouse and then try and make some sense of them. I mean, the, 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 the way in which um, particularly position and transaction data is going is you, know, you get the transaction data right in a granular way and you accept that transactions are not just accounting entities, they're life cycles. And you can pull off whatever book of record you want from that set of transaction data. The challenge is to get that transaction data in a very rich form. And I think we're starting to see some of the service providers wanting to deliver better intraday services into the front offices of their clients. And to do that requires a much more sophisticated view of transactions that's being taken than has been taken to date and a much more sophisticated view of the extraction of positions from that. So I don't think we need to be maintaining all of the bores that you talked about, the P-bore and the C-bore and the T-bore and the I-bore. What we need is a sophisticated view of transactions and a, and a data structure that enables us to extract whatever position view we want from that. And it's a single sourcing and the data warehouse is irrelevant to that. And Ian, I would just say you've, you've hit like, um, I would say until State Street acquired Charles River, there was no, we've been exactly grouped into the rest of those service providers. But the key thing you said a few minutes ago was the architecture we're now going towards and we talk about we hear us talk about cloud native processing and whether it's a data platform or an IBOR or any kind of this, it's about views in the new architecture. So it's all become views going forward. These, these are event driven architectures first of, so we actually capture events which have that richness. And then the views are the views of the people that need to see it. And to your point, the underlying call it entity masters or transaction masters have to be there to pull that off but what you articulate is exactly how we see it in the future it should be multiple it's different views it's not different databases yeah, exactly. or different siloed systems <laughs> and we go, we're going we actually have experience where we're going live with this brand new architecture with a couple of clients for the next three or four months and and we think if you hit right on it if that happens the way we think it's going to happen the way you described i think it does fundamentally change people's views of these bores and views of this silo database centric way that they've thought about their infrastructure for a long, long, long time. Yeah, we just have to get away from the idea there are multiple books of record. There's one book of right. record. And, and that one book of record isn't comprised of positions that you're enforcing on other people. It's comprised of very rich transaction histories and very rich transaction life cycles. And from that, we can derive whatever we want. Jonathan and I had the pleasure of working a few years ago with M&G on this and uh, working on the Global Eyeball Standards Working Group, uh, which came up with a set of objectives, which is essentially what we're now trying to do. I mean, at the time, four or five years ago, the ideas were good, but the technology wasn't strong enough. I mean, now we have cloud. We can be massively denormalized in the uh, data, data design for transaction capture. Um, and we can optimize to extraction and to the construction of views. And it doesn't matter how much storage we use in the process. And we can, you know, we can claim compute and storage to achieve that. So I think what, you know, the, the objectives have been clear for a while. What's happening now is that we are in a position to deliver these services and to deliver live extraction of positions on an on-demand basis. Um, and as a result of that, we can start to move away from the monolithic architectures that are represented by the uh, migration to Aladdin. 
Uh, Ian, I'm surprised you haven't used the word tokenization here. Should I be surprised? Um, well, in the context of the book of record piece and the representation of transactions, we don't need the full, um, you know, we don't need to drink the Kool-Aid on, on tokenization. What we need is to adopt some blockchain-like um, design principles in the data management, which include um, append-only data, include uh, immutable locking of records, so we have a history which has integrity and permanence, um, and so that we and we achieve um, significant flexibility in the extraction process by denormalizing the block structures. These are all blockchain ideas. They, that doesn't take us into tokenization, and it doesn't take us anywhere near consensus mechanisms or whatever. It's just a matter of getting data design right for representing transactions. But is that, that is an alternative to a warehouse. I'm right to understand that, am I? Um, well, it, you don't need a warehouse if you can get what you want on demand anyway. So as John was, was saying, if you can take a view of a rich data set and it gives you the perspective that you want, the bitemporality, the timing that you want of the data and the effective point, and it gives you the states and the semantics that you want in that data, then what are you going to get out of a data warehouse? A data warehouse just becomes a point of persistence for one particular view that okay, if you want to do that and you want to have your own private version, but that's a bit like running a Teams environment and then copying off your own spreadsheets from it. Like, it, it the, one thing that's, you. Yeah. the one thing that's, I agree with that. The one thing though that uh, is interesting, right, is with a, a solution like Snowflake, what you're allowed to do is actually create views across different companies. So, we, could, we can create a view with FactSet right now, right? So what's interesting about it is to your point, and I agree with you, it's not anymore this kind of warehouse that's a singular source, you know, just for that, but the ability to have this architecture and then literally if we're in sync and we work collectively, talk about, we talk about data models a little bit, you know, we're working now with, with like taking the, the um, um, the data that we have that underlies the investment life cycle, working with a client and then taking facts that data, bringing it together in a combined view because we're all using Snowflake and there's it's early days, but it might help us with getting these different third parties together to work together. And I always worry about standards because, you know, the I think it's important to have standards, but in reality, you know, getting a solution to markets, what matters, people buy that. And it's hard to get everyone to agree on stuff. If this technology somehow gets people to start agreeing on core data model, data models, and they start to come together that way, I think you know, it might be a pretty powerful way. And that's how we're thinking about it, right? That there is a play here when you're trying to bring non-proprietary data into an environment that there could be a big opportunity leveraging that type of technology. But it's got to be based on agreed uh, so services that have got to have standards. People have got to understand what they can rely on before they start building apps on top of it. And yep. you've, got to, you've, got to have, you've got to have the extract definition, so you've got to know what's available to you, and you've got to know what the standards are in those services. And then if we have that, and you have a an entity service, you have a, a, a transaction service, you have a, client, um, a market data service, you have a reference data service, you know they're there. You know you're going to get one sort one source of truth from those um, then you can be you can build with confidence without having to create your own data store without creating your own version of all of those truths now we, we've had a, we had a question about ownership of, of some of these data platforms which I'll come to in a minute but just before we jump to that we only have about about 10 minutes left now uh, time does fly very quickly um, you know both Ian and John have brought up the question of third parties. You know, asset managers are working with custodians, transfer agents, fund accountants. They're working with distributors, fund platforms. They're working with, uh, as you said, John, um, data and index vendors. You mentioned mentioned FactSet. Now, what's the challenge with, you know, all these people are, are, are supplying and, and processing data as well, the transaction data, which, which Ian mentioned as well. What, what's the obstacle that they represent to getting to this golden uh, data source that everybody 
can look at. Are they are they proving at this stage very helpful or very unhelpful or just getting in the way? I would say, I'll just quickly jump and turn it over. I, I think they've been very helpful, but one reason why is because we've been really clear. We're trying to manage data. We're not trying to provide data. <laughs> so our role in life at State Street and our data platform is helping a client manage data, whether it's third parties or data they generate or administrators. We're not trying to compete with the data providers. And I think that's delineating that really clearly really matters because the behaviors of the data providers, as everybody knows, it usually goes up, you know, the prices go up, the <laughs> contracts get hard to negotiate. And so our view is if we're really clear on that, then we can start as an advocate of the client. Mm -hmm. You know, frankly, there's a lot of opportunity to save money with these data providers. You are, also, um, when you, you are also a custodian bank and, and an asset manager as well. Does that create problems with other global custodian banks and other asset so it, managers? Interestingly enough, um, because of like the way, uh, if, you're in the, if you're providing a platform, especially if you're providing you know, Ibor and those kind of things, you already have to work with all the custodians, right? You got to integrate all that data. You got to bring it in. And so whether it was because of Charles River or because of our middle office business, you know, that's actually not a big issue. In fact, whether it's BNP or others, we're, they're coming to us now and saying, can we use your data platform and those kind of things. Um, so that's less of an issue. It's more, you know, it's competitive, there's emotions and all that. Um, GA, SSGA in general, I think it's, it's, it's in its own category. So luckily for us, frankly, you know, not many people see them as a quote unquote competitor because it's such, it's so overweight to index that when we talk to our clients, they really don't, whereas someone like BlackRock is a full platform for all asset strategy, all strategies and all products. So, so, so far anyway, we haven't been running into an issue with that um, for those reasons. Now, Jonathan, um, I'd like you to address this question um, from one of our listeners, which is what is your opinion on asset managers owning these platforms, e.g. Aladdin owned by BlackRock, Alpha obviously owned by State Street, also owned by Amundi. Um, and the second follow-up question, you know, how do you see this, this platform market developing? So is there an issue with asset managers owning these platforms, putting off other asset managers? And how do you see the, 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 the data platform market developing? Well, I think for a select few of asset managers, that, that is a problem. They, they, they feel that the Chinese walls, that the, uh, that the, um, the software vendors, the asset managers owning these vendors, um, Put in place may not be sufficient. However, I mean it doesn't seem to have um, stopped many in their tracks so far. I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, John's Charles River is still taken up by a, a number of, of asset managers, and actually they're, they're thinking that, you know, um, we can build on the experience that the, um, the the asset manager has if they're doing very well uh, in helping influence that system. I mean, exactly the same with, with BlackRock. I mean, um, and and Alto from Monday. Um, I, I think this is a this is a trend that's going to continue, um, and, and we will and we will see that. And you know the uh, uh, the collective wisdom of these asset managers will will help build upon the, the solutions. But you know, but going back to it, there will be a few that say, you know, I, I would like to maintain independence from uh, uh, from a software vendor who, who's owned by an asset manager. So yeah, um, but I mean, just going back, just wanted to pick up the points about the um, just we we're also talking about the holy grail of a single book of record. Um, we obviously we need to recognize the fact that you know, people look at books and records in different ways um, and we're landing these systems into a, you know, effectively not greenfield sites they're, they're they're reconciling to a custodian who has one particular view of data based on accounts and things like that we have we have we have you know portfolio managers who have a vastly different um, perception of the same data based on you know strategies and tagging and sub portfolios and that reconciling that that those different forms of data into a single into a single platform does cause a problem. I mean, we're all trying to address that. And I know John um, is trying to address that with, with Charles River, um, but it's a perennial problem and one that hasn't gone quite gone away yet. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan's absolutely right. Across, and this is a major problem that's led to all the focus on Ibor in the past, that so many different users and different business areas within a fund manager view data, view their position data and transaction data very differently and they're interested in it at different points in the transaction life cycle. And, you know, we have to, in delivering a, 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 a book of record service out of a rich transaction door, 
uh, you know, we have to be capable of extracting views which are relevant to all of those parties. So, but that's driven by both the uh, completeness within which, with which we capture the transaction life cycle and the, the states and the semantics that we support in that. So I think that is exactly the objective that we've got in creating what's now getting more called kind of universal book of record, not because it's one view, it's, it's just one source delivering to multiple perspectives. Yeah. Uh, on both of those, one thing we did just to give you guys a little sense of business model wise, I think it's really relevant is when we did our alpha platform, um, we work, I work up into the servicing business. So we kept SSG off to the side for that. Frankly, we didn't want to have anyone worrying about that. The other big point though, is where the service provider, why, and this is giving, hopefully it doesn't give us something away. These guys will catch up on this. Um, you know, the power of being a service provider is you can transfer the financial risk to us on data quality, right? Yeah. So well, that's a huge difference, right? So one thing our clients, when they talk about outsourcing this, this platform and the services around, if we're the service provider, we take financial risk that that data is right. And you guys have seen, right, whether it's the, you know, it was a well-publicized issue a firm had on the rebalancing last year, you know, very large, uh, they had to pay out. Like that's something that to put our kind of where we put our financial um, call money where our mouth is, is take the risk that this data is right. And if it's not right, and it's in a workflow that we manage, we're, we're on the hook to cover it if it's wrong. Right, we're, we're, we're down to our last uh, few minutes now. So I'd, I'd like to just try and bring this to a close by discussing, I suppose, the vision which we're, we're heading towards here. Now, John, John used the word events, capturing events to discuss what, to, you know, to describe what the Alpha platform is trying to do. Uh, and that's a kind of, it's rather like accountants capture events and put them into uh, annual reports and accounts. And they've done that by by sampling. Are we now looking at a world in which the technology and the digitized data is such that you can digest vast amounts of information? So you're no longer describing, de deriving what you think is going on inside your business from uh, partial sets of data uh, or from, from sampling, if you like, if you're, if you're, if you're, produce, if you're the external auditors, but you're actually starting to assimilate all the information. It's like this is a live beast, which is being fed by what's really going on uh, inside the asset management business and in the markets outside the asset management business. So we're moving towards a, a kind of real time taking of the pulse of the business at all, at all times. That's what capturing events. And so you're, anything you produce, the reports to your clients, reports to your portfolio managers, the, the data which the risk managers use, the compliance people are actually working off real-time data, seeing what's really going on in the real world. Is that what we're, we're heading towards, a real-time events-driven data management and processing platform? Greg, is that, is, is my, I may not have expressed it very well, but is this the direction that we're evolving towards? Absolutely, Dominic. And I think that the key question is, how long is it going to take to get there and, and how much is it going to cost and who, who's going to do that work? Because the you know, asset management is pure data now. Yeah? And when you get that data organized in a data model, which is a, you know, a key word because the industry doesn't have a standard data model, I think the vendors and the platform owners are, are the closest to sort of articulating that for the rest of the industry. If you've got that rich data model that you can ask, you know, produce the various views that John's mentioned, then, you know, what's going to happen next is it, when, the, when the data quality is at a sufficient level, you can then apply, you know, and, I, I, and nobody would have been conspicuously diligent and not see the word artificial intelligence and machine learning. There's lots of, that's freighted with lots of misunderstanding. But when the data is that clean and you've got that much data, we are then going to start seeing uh, a, a degree of much more uh, automation of processes, which means reduction of cost. And we're also going to see you know, prediction or, or uh, you know, suggestions around ne next best action and resource allocations that's going to make the asset manager smarter. But I think that's an easy picture to paint. Everyone would agree with that. I think the real question is, given where we are today, how long is it going to take us to get there? 
are there any ma managers that are not going to be able to make that transition for cultural or vision or technology reasons? And what's going to happen for the ones that do get across the line? Uh, how, how hard are they going to make life for the ones who, who, who don't make it in time? I think there's going to be a real bifurcation, just like we're seeing the, the trillion dollar club emerge with real, real scale. The ones that really grab hold of this data model and then get their data organized are going to you know, be an order of magnitude ahead of their current peers at the moment. Okay, we've had a rush of questions coming from the audience, which I'd, which I'd like to address here. Um, Michael Healy says, why does everyone have their own copies of master files? Take the security master as an example. Is there an opportunity for blockchain to create one source of the truth and everyone reuses it? Ian, is that is that possible or not? Just very quick. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what we're what we're talking about moving towards. So so getting a set of defined services which are available to um, that anyone building application, building applets, building whatever, um, and the, you know the standard four in that are reference data entity data, including clients, counterparties, and investables. Um, the security data, um, market data, and transaction data. And the transaction data is internal. The others, uh, and, and to some extent, the entity data is internal, but there's also elements of external there. So it's not a, the question is not, is it all internal? Is it all, you know, can, can what's now internal be purely external. It's not like that because transactions are internal to the organization um, and not readily shareable, blockchain or otherwise. Um, and But some entity data is completely shareable. Some market data is totally shareable. So what we need is to have a, an architecture where there's a common definition of a service. You can segment your own uh, in-house uh, augment rather than segment your own in-house data on top of that, but in the same form. So it's coming out the same service. Um, and then on top of that, we need what you know John was describing as, as views, but I've been describing as extracts that, that give you the view that you want at the time that you want it. I mean, we're basically growing up from a, from a position where the, the, the standard asset manager and service provider architecture was based on snapshot data and batch architectures and on a daily cycle. And we're growing up from that to seeing that the data that underlies these services is actually all time series data. It's all events in a time series. And okay, our time is up, so we must be, must be brief now. Um, another question, how do, how do you see regulatory affecting data, in particular data access with issues such as cross-border, etc.? I'm not quite sure what's being asked here, but it often strikes me that asset managers are filling in all these regulatory forms, creating this data, they send it off to the regulators and it's never seen again or used by anybody at all. Um, does that stuff have value quickly, John, to what you're doing on the Alpha platform? You know, if somebody fills in for yeah. F or E. Yeah, it's a common use case that it's funny when we get into these discussions, you know, that use case comes up Again, it's one that's not typically core, but it's also one that ourselves and others are solving as a specific thing that for call it regulatory reporting of all types. And again, I think the ability to bring the data to a place where people can actually create those reports is like there's two parts to this. I think we're gonna create the data that people can use. And then we will be one of many firms that you know, are nuanced around different types of reporting to provide regulators. Mm -hmm. Um, Sanjay Vatsar agrees with what you've been saying, um, Ian. He says the data warehouse based approach has passed us. We need to move to DeFi data ecosystem, leaves data with the owner, leverages, leverages the chain for ensuring the data is evergreen at the time of use. Uh, he, he, he refers to the Embedium platform, which credentializes and hashes the data on the chain without moving the data from the owner system. So, what we're talking about tokenizing data, isn't it? Um, views is the right way of looking at it. It's not a data warehouse, it's a DeFi data environment. Exactly, Ian Hunt, he says. So you've got one fan there, Ian. Um, DeFi data environment available on demand. Now here's a, just a question for you, um, John. Uh, I think, what do the panel, because you're involved with this, what do the panel think of the hub announcement? Uh, and for John, how does this fit into the alpha strategy? Yeah, great question. So we're, as alpha, involved in many initiatives that are happening across the industry, as well as firms that are you know, who want to be part of Alpha in terms of this whole creating together, solving this data challenge. And so we, um, 
you know, Pimco is a large client of State Streets. We've been involved for a year now working with them and Hub and, um, and IHM and, and MAN group to kind of sort out where they are. I think it's early, they're an early stage firm uh, with, with big ambitions. Uh, we've committed to work with them as given our data model and the things that we do. It's a little early to, to really understand. Like the good question somebody asked was, how do you differentiate? I think it's a little early for them to start differentiating themselves. But as they do, you know, they know that they'll be aligned with our model and how we're thinking about the data platform. Thanks. Funny, I was going. I was. I was going to bring up the hub um, as a as a talking point as well in my sort of closing remarks. I mean, I think there's a great. I mean, it's a it's a great initiative. I mean, there's a, there's a great team over there. I mean, I've got huge respect for Naomi Clark, who's the CDO um, over at the hub. Um, I mean, I think for those companies that are targeting data management outsourcing, they can only serve to improve the quality of of data across the industry. I mean, the question clearly is, can they accommodate the needs and specific requirements of all their potential clients? But I, mean, I wish them uh, a huge amount of luck and obviously we'll all be watching what they do with, with great interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're six minutes over, so we must stop. We're just, I'll give each of you a, a chance to say one last thing very quickly, if you can, in like, you know, 15 seconds, if we can manage it, 30 if we can't. So what's gonna be different about the way asset managers go about their work once we've got to this data or even halfway towards this data nirvana? John. I, listen, I think we said a little bit, I think the, it's hard for people to see it <laughs> because the speed at which things will operate, the decision-making, the, the, the dramatically reduced number of people doing work that they probably feel is not really meaningful, all of that. And then the ecosystem idea, if we do it right, it's not just the asset manager, it's who they're interacting with. It also is going to be similarly on a, this type of platform. And I think the world just speeds up in a way that's hard to for people to understand right now. Okay, Greg, f faster, cheaper, fewer people sitting in your asset manager in the house. I think you're on mute. Uh, uh, agree with John, speed, cadence of change. And I guess the, the, the implication of that is a really strong division between winners and losers. It won't just be a bit different. It's going to be a, an enormous gulf and abyss. Okay, so Jonathan, your clients all, of course, are going to be winners, I'm sure. But uh, sure. do you have anything to add to that speed and and, and lower cost? I mean, I mean that, that's the uh, the objectives, and I think we're gonna we're gonna see what's uh, the uh, the industry incrementally moving there. I mean, it's 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 a large industry. We need to. Uh, um, it, it won't quite go as quick as, as everybody hopes it will do, I think, but it'd be great if it does, and I'm, I'm eager to see that happen. But, you know, it's, it's um, um, yeah, cost and, uh, and functionality are clearly the, uh, the outcomes of this uh, uh, for folk. Mm -hmm. Now, Ian, just a, a, a last vision from you, perhaps about the, the universal book of record. You, you've heard all that praise from Sanjay Batsa. Is that, is that where, we're, where we're going to? Universal that, Book of Record is, is achievable. I mean, the technology is there now to do this. We've got now multiple instances of people delivering very rich uh, transaction stores from which we're taking live extracts mm -hmm. and, and at, with, with performance. So I think that's, that's here. In answer to your, your more your general question, closing question to the panel, I think asset managers will increasingly be able to focus on their real tasks, which I think are twofold. One is improving the quality of their intellectual property about markets and conditions and investment. And the second is looking after their clients. Thank you. I'm afraid we really must stop there. Um, I'd like to thank our panellists, Greg Glass, Ian Hunt, John Plansky, Jonathan Hammond. I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for, for all your questions. Um, we will be uh, publishing the recording of this event. We'll also be producing a summary, executive summary, and a full summary of it, uh, and a clip of the best moments from it. Uh, and we will make sure that everybody who's registered for the webinar gets to see those. But for now, I think uh, the five of us must, must say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. You can find this discussion on www.futureoffinance.biz and indeed other uh, planned webinars under current events. I am Wendy Gallagher. If you would like uh, more information about how to work with us, please do email on wendy.gallagher at futureoffinance.biz. Thank you once again.